we're gonna we're gonna get started. Talk behind, and I'm gonna give the world's shortest introduction to someone who could have an introduction that would take all of his time. Uh, Dr. Charles Sinner uh, has a, uh, a, a long career as a, a speechwriter, a, 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 a an expert witness in uh, Nazi war crimes trials, uh, director of a public television station, president of a university. Um, I know. Mean, I think he might have driven a milk truck once. I don't know. He's done everything. Beer, uh, <laughs> beer, beer truck. Beer uh, truck. In any case, uh, Charlie Sidner is someone that I uh, am proud to call a colleague and a friend, and I was delighted that he was able to come and speak to us today. So I'm going to just let, let uh, the former director of the museum and now a senior historian share some wonderful uh, insight with you about the Holocaust. Charlie. Thank you, Elena. Thank you very much, Elena. Actually, she's understating things a bit. Uh, I tried to persuade her to run away with me and told her that if she did, she wouldn't regret it, even though I'm 74. Uh, no, Elena, Elena uh, took the time and the initiative to come to see me right after I first came to the museum in 2012 or 2013 invited me to Tidewater. Uh, I, I went the first time, I think, by myself, and then the second time I took Megan Ferenci with me, our director of education, whom you met uh, in, the, uh, in the lobby, who is responsible for the extraordinary impact that the museum has had in outreach to public and private school teachers through, throughout Central Virginia. Uh, our Teacher Education Institute in the summers, and you have at least one alumnus of uh, the most recent uh, institute in your group this morning, uh, over the 10 years it has existed, more than 700 teachers uh, have been through TEI. And those are primarily teachers from, sis from schools in the Commonwealth of Virginia, but also include Maryland, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, North Carolina, Tennessee and West Virginia uh, in, in the years that passed. Similarly with the school systems that, that bring classes here, middle school children and high school children, uh, I'm very, very proud to say that uh, Norfolk Academy uh, stands probably at, at near the top of the list, bringing their entire senior class here uh, to experience the museum, uh, which we're glad to be able to do because uh, logistically, it has become impossible for them to undertake uh, a field trip to the uh, big museum, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington in one day. You simply can't get up there and get back. Uh, you can't get up there from Richmond and get back, uh, barely, uh, in, in one day any longer. We, we have no illusions about supplanting uh, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, but uh, we are glad to be able to uh, affirm what's going on there in, uh, in a major way. And with exhibits that in our museum bring the images, the experience, what people remember and imagine the Holocaust to have been, bring that down to the level of a community, to the local level, where the, the effect can be more direct and immediate than it is in something as huge and as overwhelming, as overpowering uh, as the U.S. Museum is in Washington, D.C. We have uh, important partnerships here. Uh, I, I'm not sure how much Elena has told you about the museum, but I'll tell you very quickly before we talk about language and how the perversion of the German language was essential to the success of the, the murderous agenda of the, the perpetrators. Uh, this museum was founded uh, by three men. Uh, the principal founder, Jay Ibsen, is a child survivor of the Holocaust. He was in the Kovno ghetto in Lithuania until his father managed to smuggle uh, Jay and his mother and himself out of the museum shortly before uh, the SS moved in to liquidate the, the ghetto by shipping the remaining Jews who were alive uh, to Estonia, 
where most of them perished in, in work camps there. This was in October of 1943. Jay Ibsen is the principal founder, the driving force behind this museum. Uh, we moved into this building in 2003 after initially being located in the educational building at Temple Beth L on Grove Avenue here in Richmond. We are recognized by the General Assembly and the governors as the official museum of the Holocaust uh, in Virginia. Uh, we are entirely privately supported. We receive no public funds. We have no uh, standing uh, uh, grant or uh, uh, commission of money from the Commonwealth of Virginia or from the federal government. We are entirely privately supported. Mr. Weinstein, whom you met in the, uh, the lobby, is the principal funder of the museum and has been since its inception. Uh, he and his family together provide the museum with nearly $1 million per year uh, to support the operations and uh, the renovations and other things that go on. A museum is an incredibly expensive uh, place to run. Uh, I'm happy to say we have a new roof on the museum. A new roof on an old building is a wonderful thing to have. And a museum with a new roof is a museum with a future. Uh, no, no doubt about that. Um, we have a staff of uh, unusually dedicated, energetic, committed young people uh, who are responsible for all the things that are around you th that you'll see uh, today while you're here. Uh, Tim Hensley, who is the director of exhibits, the archivist, and the, uh, the curator of the museum, uh, is the driving force behind uh, these exhibits and the way they interpret various subjects in the Holocaust to uh, visitors to uh, the museum. Megan Ferenci is uh, the uh, director of education, a, a school teacher herself uh, who taught at Franklin Academy here in Richmond in the public system. Megan has been a longtime student of the history of the Holocaust and brings a knowledge of the history itself uh, to the other invaluable uh, quality she carries, and that is having been a public school teacher in several different systems, she understands the constraints that teachers have to work under, including the frequently idiotic uh, and bureaucratic things that uh, 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 attend. Uh, last week, one of the teachers in TEI, a very, very bright young lady from Isle of Wight County, told me that she is not permitted uh, to use uh, video documentaries in teaching the Holocaust because it uh, would distract uh, from the requirement to get uh, the subject covered in the short time that she has to cover it. Uh, that, in, in the catch-22 world of things that's crazy, that ranks right up there with uh, the best of them as far as I'm concerned. Recognizing that in the schools there's not much time to uh, talk about this subject, what we try to do is crack the door open. If we can, if we can provide teachers and ordinary visitors here with enough information and enough of a point of light that it's sparks their curiosity or makes them uh, eager to learn more, then they can take the crack in the door and open that crack as wide as they want to. They can push the door halfway open or they can push the door all the way open. And invariably, I think, uh, at least in my experience in education, uh, teachers seldom lack for resourcefulness and individual ingenuity when there's something they really want to get done. Uh, they can figure out a way to work around the administration uh, or to defeat the administration at its own game uh, if, that, if that is a hindrance. Uh, and for that, uh, for many other things, they're to be saluted. In the museum, uh, we welcome an opportunity to have programs here. And that means not only programs like this this morning when the museum staff are carrying uh, the ball and, and showing you the place, it also means academic programs 
uh, here. And we have been fortunate in the years that I've been associated with the museum to have some of the leading authorities in the world in the history of the Holocaust come here uh, to give lectures or to participate in panel discussions. Uh, Yehuda Bauer, uh, Yitzhak Arad uh, from Israel, uh, Christopher Browning uh, from the United States, uh, Deborah Lipstadt will be coming here uh, next spring uh, for a special program on uh, the, the, the phenomenon of Holocaust denial and revisionism, which sadly appears to be growing rather than receding, even in the face of the powerful evidence uh, of the existence of the Holocaust. Uh, Wendy Lower has, has been here, the young woman whose remarkable new book uh, opens up the whole field of, of how women perpetrators these are young women, uh, young German women who were volunteers, many of them as SS auxiliaries, how they helped succeed in persecuting and murdering Jews in the Nazi-occupied regions of, of uh, Eastern Europe. Hitler's Furies, which is the title of her book, was shortlisted for the National Book Award. Uh, she is the uh, most illustrious graduate student of my close friend Richard Brightman, who just retired at American University. Richard has been here several times. Richard's most recent book, I hope some of you may have seen, is entitled FDR and the Jews. And it is the latest and most objectively thorough look at the whole question of how and why uh, the American government acted as it did uh, with respect to international anti-Semitism uh, the persecution of German and then European Jews, and then the Holocaust itself, once the government had irrefutable evidence and knowledge uh, that the European Jews constituted a very separate and very distinct and more important uh, category of enemies in the, in the Nazi hierarchy of people to separate, isolate, persecute, and murder. Um, my perspective on the subject has been informed for years with a view that the Holocaust, the Shoah, the destruction of the European Jews is first and foremost the greatest and most deliberate process of human destruction in the lifetime of man. No other society, no other order, no other human or natural disaster resulted in the pinpointing and murder, the killing of so many people as did the Holocaust, as did the, the Nazi Shoah. It remains, hopefully it will remain, the unique experience in the horrific panoply of genocide. And I hope it remains unique, and it was unique, in my estimation as an historian, because it is the only instance in which a great modern industrial state, a leading power in the world, a country of advanced culture, a country of, of path-breaking science and industry and literature and art and medicine, a country that represented the most progressive index of almost all areas of human endeavor. The country in which uh, aspirin and the x-ray uh, are among the, uh, the gifts to uh, humankind's modern history. A country that, having achieved all of these things, having produced a long list of Nobel laureates, having given the world uh, Brahms and Luther, Bach and Schiller, turned within a matter of two decades and gave the world uh, Himmler and Heydrich and Bormann and Goebbels, not to mention Adolf Hitler. How this happened uh, is still a matter of endless inquiry and the huge open question in the process. What it represented is something we are able to come more uh, readily to terms with in a museum of this size uh, and with this, with this mission. And specifically, how 
how the process itself worked. The Holocaust would not have succeeded had it not been for a number of variables, all of which factored into the equation of persecution and mass murder to the Germans' advantage, to the Germans' agenda. The first of these, I think, was uh, the complicity of local collaborators. The history of anti-Semitism in the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, was nothing new uh, when uh, the Nazis came to power in Germany in 1933. And in the Baltic states, and in particular in Latvia and Lithuania, the Germans were able to recruit very quickly uh, collaborators who were not only willing to hunt down and arrest Jews, but were willing to imprison, torture, and then help murder uh, Jews on the, the soils of their country. The same is true in what is now Belarus, uh, the, the, what the Germans called White Ruthenia, the area of the Western Soviet Union north of the Ukraine uh, that became part of the, uh, uh, the German, uh, German occupied Eastern territories under the administration of Alfred Rosenberg, who was one of the most vicious and unremitting uh, and sadistic of the, uh, the anti-Semites in the radical circle around Hitler, uh, but who was also a figure of uh, great ridicule uh, among his Nazi colleagues because of his, uh, shall we say, eccentricities and uh, his uh, confused and muddled thinking uh, and speaking. But, but collaboration on the part of non-German local people, particularly in Lithuania and in the Ukraine. The persecution of Jews in the Ukraine was as savage or more savage than anywhere else in uh, Eastern Europe. And the Ukrainians from the very first were willing uh, accomplices to the Germans in the roundup and murder of Jews. The Ukrainians were still willing to do what the Germans, the SS, had itself condemned as a policy in Germany, and that was called gutter anti-Semitism. That is the open, violent uh, beating and, and torturing of Jews in the streets, in public. This had been, uh, this had been uh, brought to a halt as official uh, Nazi policy tolerated in, uh, in 1936 and 1937. As I'm sure all of you, or m many of you, I hope, have seen, in the photographs and the videos taken by the Germans themselves of the first week of the German occupation of the Ukraine, particularly the, the, city of, uh, the cities of Lviv and Kiev, here uh, Jews, are being, uh, Jews are being hounded and hunted and tortured and murdered in front of cameras. German photographic cameras and German film cameras, 16 millimeter cameras. This is one of the few uh, instances where uh, the perpetrators themselves gleefully were willing to document visually what they were doing. Another instance is on a wall downstairs that you'll see in an exhibit. We have photographs that the Germans took of the murder of Jews in downtown Kovno, Lithuania on the 26th and 27th of June, 1941 when local Lithuanian anti-Semites were beating Jews to death in an open public square, were beating Jews to death with iron bars, while German soldiers stood around the square with their Leica cameras taking pictures of this and laughing. All right, complicity and assistance. You can find it in Romania, you can find it, of course, eventually in Hungary, you can find it everywhere, and you find that in Poland, where the largest community of Jews uh, who fell into the clutches of the Nazis uh, ended up being uh, most savagely uh, persecuted and murdered, you can find that the collapse of the, the entire governmental system in Poland and the, the various forms of German occupation made up for any shortage in, uh, in complicity. But everywhere 
everywhere the Nazis unleashed the Holocaust, local anti-Semites were ready, willing, and able to help in the persecution of Jews. In Norway, in Holland, in Belgium, in tiny Luxembourg, one of the first earliest photographs of a local policeman giving the Nazi salute to Heinrich Himmler is a photograph taken in June 1940, Himmler in his car driving through uh, Luxembourg City and uh, local Luxembourg policemen giving the Nazi salute to the leader of the German SS. An obvious sign of, of uh, uh, open and willing uh, collaboration. So in Norway, in Holland, in Belgium, in Luxembourg, in France, the cooperation of the Vichy government, the collaboration of the Vichy government was, was absolutely indispensable to the Germans' ability to eventually deport and murder more than 70,000 French Jews, many of them at Auschwitz uh, and at Sobibor. And there are other factors, uh, transportation systems. Europe had, at the time the Holocaust began, the world's most modern system of land-based transportation. Trains, buses, public transportation, paved roads. The Germans proved more than able to ship their victims over long distances to the permanent killing centers that they had erected in Eastern Europe. Auschwitz, Majdanek, and the, the ad hoc pure extermination facilities at Belzec Sobibor uh, Treblinka and Helmno, uh, these, these remote places where Jews were shipped out of sight to be murdered were at the end of networks of railroads and roads that proved more than adequately uh, suited to the tasks of mass murder. And there are others. But in this equation, there are also factors language. Language. Among the things that the Nazis did to aid and abet this agenda was the creation of a special kind of perverted German that became the language of, uh, of the perpetrators. And among the historians of the Holocaust, one of my closest friends was the late Henry Friedlander. Henry was a great scholar. He was a Berliner. He was sent to Auschwitz as a teenager on one of the first transports from Berlin on October the 15th, 1941. He was sent first to the Lodz ghetto in Poland, which became the second largest of the Nazi uh, ghettos. These huge death traps where Jews were put on ice while they could be starved uh, and brutalized and, and the last possibilities or capabilities of individual resistance weakened before they were shipped to their death. But Henry was, as a teenage boy, sent from Berlin with his family to Lotch. He survived in the Lotch ghetto for three years, was then deported to Auschwitz in the summer of 1944. The rest of his family perished there. Henry survived. He happened to be uh, of the, the, the right age for uh, survival. After the war, he came to the United States, became one of the leading scholars of the history of the Holocaust. He taught for many years at Brooklyn College. He was a mainstay in the organization of historian, in organizing historians into interest groups that shared information and advanced scholarship. And his great work uh, Prelude to the Final Solution, the History of the Euthanasia Program, is a landmark study that connects the first German enterprise in mass murder, which was the killing of the physically and men mentally handicapped, uh, a, a mass murder project that began in 1939. Uh, Henry very uh, capably documents how the success of the Euthanasia Program influenced the success of the Holocaust in providing the killers with the technical means, gassing, the technical means to murder large numbers of people very quietly and very efficiently. 
Among the things that Henry contributed to the scholarship is a little known and rarely cited article that he published in the 1970s or 80s that deals with the language that the Nazis and the SS developed uh, to, to describe to their most, uh, most agreeable comfort level, to describe what they were doing, to create a vernacular, if you will, a new form of expression uh, that would uh, transmit knowledge that everybody could understand who was in on the business of being the perpetrator. And Henry says this language divides itself into two parts. The first part was very public. This was the propaganda, the, uh, the, not, the bellicose, uh, loud, overbearing Nazi language of uh, uh, unrestraint, the language that claimed that the Nazi party was the greatest political movement in history, that Adolf Hitler was a world historical genius who was going to save Germany from uh, all of the evils of uh, modern society. It was a language of emotion, a language that claimed that there were no limits to what uh, Germany could achieve under the Nazis. Uh, it was a, a, a language that uh, always spoke in, in grandiose terminology. Whenever the Nazi party held a rally, their language of propaganda said this was a great historical event. If Hitler happened to be the principal speaker at that rally, it became a world historical event. The principal architect, the articulator of this, was Paul Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda minister who was among Hitler's most radical, loyal followers, and I think was intellectually the single most brilliant individual in the Nazi hierarchy. And if you can acknowledge the fact that a great mind and great evil can coexist in the same historic figure, then you have to accord Goebbels the statue of greatness in what he was able to achieve. Uh, it was Goebbels, for example, who in uh, the, uh, the Nazi political campaigns of 31 and 32 uh, developed a political maxim that seems to have had a life of its own. He said something to the effect that the people in politics, people become softened up to campaigning. They become, uh, they become malleable in the face of loud and declamatory rhetoric. And in their primitive simplicity, the people are more easily taken in by the big lie than by a little lie. So in politics, the central art is to lie, is to fabricate, to lie about your opponents and to make them look weak and despicable and criminal and perverse and as unworthy and as inhuman as possible, all the while developing the vernacular that makes yourself look heroic, grandiose, unblemished, uh, the, the, the ideal solution to society's problems. So uh, Goebbels took his cues from Hitler. Hitler himself was, of course, a great orator. There's no question about that. He was the 20th century's greatest and most effective uh, demagogue. He persuaded a nation of 68 million people to follow him into the abyss. And as uh, Sir Ian Kershaw, who is Hitler's most, I think, uh, most successful biographer, the ablest of the people who've studied Adolf Hitler, whose two-volume biography of Hitler stands now at the top of the list of things that are uh, that are must read, Kershaw observed that if there had been a Gallup poll or a UPI time, whatever that thing is that they have, or what's the funny name of that university that's involved in these polls now, if you'd taken a scientific poll, a political poll in Germany in March of 1945, Think of the time now. You'd taken a poll in March of 1945, 
Hitler's approval rating would have been in the 70th percentile. That's how popular he was right on the cusp of, of the, the, the country going over the abyss. That's the hold he continued to have on German people. Now, the, the, uh, the, public, uh, the public vernacular, the Goebbels vernacular, is, uh, this is as far as I get technically with show and tell in a program is to hold up a book. Uh, but this is the latest biography of Joseph Goebbels. There are probably a dozen. Uh, some uh, that have been originally written in German and translated into English, like this one, by a younger German historian named Peter Longerish. We have copies of this downstairs in the, uh, in the museum shop if you want to look at it or if you'd like to, to buy one. I can tell you uh, this is something that I devoured uh, when I first got it because it is absolutely on the mark in uh, uh, the way Longerish has analyzed Goebbels' contribution to the success of Nazism and to the success uh, of the Holocaust. This is a first-rate uh, first rate study. And Goebbels is the, is the principal art articulator of the public language of, the Holo uh, of Nazi Germany. The other language, the private language, is the language of the Holocaust. It is the bureaucratic language developed by government officials in the ministries of the interior and justice, in the, uh, among the state secretaries of the agricultural ministry, uh, the Fuhrer's chancellery, and other official and semi-official agencies of the Nazi government. It is the language of these bureaucrats who developed a terminology that Sir Ian Kershaw calls uh, the, the, uh, the endeavor of working towards the Fuhrer working towards the Fuhrer. Put another way, it means that there were hundreds of top-level officials throughout the, the, uh, the agencies of government in Nazi Germany. There are hundreds of top-level officials who are trying to outdo each other to please Hitler, to draw attention from Hitler to the fact that they are willing, they are willing to take what they believe to be his most important objectives, and they're willing to be more radical in solving them than even Hitler would be. In a very interesting and revealing after-dinner conversation in uh, December of 1941, Hitler was talking about the overwhelming crush of work that fell on him as the, uh, as the Fuhrer, as the head of state and the head of government and all of the paperwork and all of the other things that he had to do and all the decisions he had to make. And he said, where would I be, where would I be if I did not have around me men I know I can trust, men whom I can be certain will do exactly what I would do in a given situation and probably do it more completely and more to the satisfaction I would seek than even I could do it myself. Where would I be if I did not have men around me this reliable? And I can tell you who he had in mind when he, when he made that statement. The person he had in mind was SS General Reinhard Heydrich, who was the number two person in the SS, Heinrich Himmler's alter ego, and uh, uh, Heydrich uh, was known as H.H.H., uh, -H -H, uh, Himmler's Herren heist Heydrich. Uh, Himmler's brain is Heydrich. And uh, one of the uh, state secretaries, and I think it was Wilhelm Stuckert in the Ministry of the Interior, once said that uh, Himmler with Heydrich is everything. Heydrich without Himmler would be nothing. Very, very profound because Himmler was the, the figurehead. He was the old fighter. He was the person who had been a Nazi close to Hitler as early as 1923. He was, the, he was in the Nazi old guard. And around Adolf Hitler, the men who were most radical in, in focusing on the Jewish issue, the Jewish 
uh, problem, the Jewish question, which was at the center of the Nazi political agenda, to solve the, the, the Jewish question, eventually in what became the ultimate euphemism, the final solution to the Jewish question. Among those radicals around Hitler, there was Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, Reinhard Heydrich, his deputy, uh, Martin Bormann, who was the Nazi party secretary and the successor to uh, Rudolf Hess, Philip Buhler, who was an old uh, Nazi old fighter and the head of uh, Hitler's chancellery, uh, Wilhelm Stuckart, who was the state secretary in the Reich Ministry of the Interior and who presided over such pleasant activities as the involuntary sterilization of people who were considered to be uh, half Jews. And there were others. These men tried to work towards the Fuhrer, which meant they tried to figure out what Hitler wanted and give it to him uh, in a way that would make him absolutely uh, pleased and would demonstrate anew their personal loyalty to Hitler. To do this, they developed a kind of private language. And in that language and terminology, Hitler was never referred to as the Fuhrer. When one of them sent a memo to another saying, uh, it, is, it has been decided at the highest level that the Jews remaining in Poland should be subjected to special treatment before the end of 1942. Now think about that. It has been decided at the highest level that the Jews remaining alive in Poland should be subjected to special treatment before the end of 1942. Decided at the highest level means Hitler. There is no level higher than Hitler. Special treatment was one of those perverse clerical euphemisms that stood for murder. And the way in which uh, the what, what was called the final solution, the ultimate solution to uh, the Jewish question, the way special treatment was administered brought forth a, a bevy of terminology on its own. The, the key word in this is action, A-K-T-I-O-N, which means action. And in this regard, a, a, whole special, uh, a whole special of emotive terminology came into the, into the fore that represented older, uh, older, more Germanic forms of usage in the language that had long been outdated. The leading officials uh, in the regional administrations in Nazi Germany were called Gauleiters, the leaders of a Gau. A Gau was an administrative district. There hadn't been any Gaus in Germany uh, since uh, the time of the Romans for 2,000 years or so. But now the Nazis resurrected this term because to them it sounded Nordic, it sounded Germanic, it sounded, uh, it sounded like it was full of testosterone. Uh, so the leader of an of a, of a, a administrative district became a Gauleiter. And the Gauleiters were the men who were personally known to and favored by Hitler. Uh, they were his closest uh, collaborators. They were the men who repeatedly had to prove uh, how committed they were to the most radical part of Hitler's agenda, which was to get rid of the Jews. Goebbels was not only the propaganda minister, he was a Gauleiter. He was the Gauleiter of Berlin. So he had administrative power in Berlin and was directly responsible for ordering the arrest deportation and murder of a portion of the uh, Jews living in Berlin after 1941. So uh, the final solution became a terminology introduced in 1940. The first evidence I can find of it in an official communication is in a letter by Reinhard Heydrich to the German foreign minister, Joachim von Ribbentrop. It's a letter from June the 22nd, 1940, in which Heydrich refers to uh, the coming final solution to the Jewish question, which will have to involve 
the inclusion or the incorporation of millions of Jews who were not yet under Nazi domination, and additional millions of Jews who could be expected in the future to be under Nazi domination. That's a clear reference to the Soviet Union, the five and a half million Jews living in, in uh, the Soviet Union. Well, to, to carry out the final solution, uh, Heydrich coined a phrase, a territorial final solution. Now, some historians uh, interpreted that to mean that uh, Heydrich wanted to ship all the European Jews to Madagascar. The so-called Madagascar thing had been part of the anti-Semitic uh, rundown in Europe for uh, almost a half a century by the time the Nazis came along. And the, uh, once the uh, French had been defeated in 1940, the idea was uh, we'll use the merchant marine fleet of Germany, France, and the other European countries. We'll round up all the Jews in Europe. We'll, we'll deport them to ports. We'll load them on freighters. We'll send them to Madagascar, and there we'll just let them uh, rot or uh, leave them to their fate. That's not what Heydrich meant. What Heydrich meant by a territorial final solution was a final solution, i.e. murder, conducted on the European continent. And he very clearly was looking toward the Soviet Union. Well, how do you conduct a final solution? How, if you're going to kill all these people or subject them to what Heydrich calls special treatment. And that term, uh, Sonderbehandlungen, had been used in the concentration camps since 1938-1939. To do this, once the war with the Soviet Union began, with Hitler's permission, Heydrich organized special units of the SS and police, Einsatzkommandos, action commandos, Sonderkommandos, special command uh, commandos, uh, armed uh, with uh, the latest in uh, communications technology, uh, with uh, machine guns and other weapons of, uh, other light weapons designed to kill large numbers of people, uh, and uh, in, uh, in battalion strength or larger, these police units were let loose into the Soviet Union. They followed the German armies right behind the advancing troops, and their task was to round up and kill all the Jews they found in the communities they came through in following the advance of the armies. And th through this, there, there developed a whole new series of, of definitions and, and contexts. Uh, the special treatment of uh, Jews, the, uh, the liquidation of remaining elements of bandits. Very interesting uh, terminology. The liquidation of the remaining elements of bandits. That meant kill everybody uh, in a certain area who is still there who's carrying a gun. And uh, once Jewish armed resistance to the Nazis began in the spring of 1943, uh, Jews were never referred to as partisans. Uh, those who were, who were in the civilian populations who took up arms against the Germans, the, ger the military would refer to in communiques as partisans or bandits. Jewish groups were always referred to as subhumans or subhuman bandits. They were never accorded the status of being, of being uh, armed combatants worthy of uh, the name in, in a communication uh, because they were fighting against the Germans. They were somehow a subhuman criminal species that was capable of uh, the most nefarious uh, forms of shooting German soldiers in the back. Well, what the hell were German soldiers doing? German SS men, but shooting Jews in, in the back. And the language the language of the final solution, the language of the Holocaust, reflects in its, in its foundation. It reflects in its driving force. It reflects in all the, sort, all the force that animated it. It reflects the hatred that Adolf Hitler carried for Jews. Now, Hitler didn't just hate Jews. Uh, hatred was the emotion most natural to Adolf Hitler. And he hated a lot of things. 
Uh, he hated weeds. Uh, he hated small dogs. Uh, he hated certain types of uh, feminine dress. He hated jazz, uh, the form of music. Uh, he hated uh, certain types of American movies. But, and he hated a lot of other things. And he hated gypsies. And he hated uh, Slavs. But most of all, and most importantly, he hated Jews. His anti-Semitism knew no bounds or limits. And he is on record, uh, not only once or twice, but multiple times, publicly and privately, telling those who were his listeners that he intended to murder every last Jew in Europe. The annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe, that's on the record. That's, that's in the sound recordings that survive. It's in the transcript of his speeches. And it comes from a special code language that Hitler developed that is, in my mind, the most chilling and the most unsettling vernacular of hatred ever uttered by an important, powerful, historic figure. It is the language of epidemiology. Hitler spoke about Jews as an oncologist would talk about cancer. Jews, Hitler said, were the ferment of decomposition. They were like lice. They were like vermin, uh, insects, uh, cockroaches, uh, all of the things that infest and infect uh, a healthy human body. Hitler associated uh, with the Jews. They were lice, they were vermin, they were maggots. They were like the, the, the embryonic uh, life form of flies that uh, should be eradicated or eliminated or annihilated before they were allowed to become uh, full adults. They were lice, they were vermin, they were maggots, they were bacilli. They are like microscopic germs, the Jews are in Hitler's view, who are, are by nature parasitical and live off of the body of the host countries they infect. And in his uh, uh, book, if you can call it that, Mein Kampf, uh, which I have actually read. Now, I didn't read it in one sitting and I didn't read it willingly. Uh, but over the years, I've had to read it because if you, if you wade through all of the turgid nonsense and the other crazy stuff that's in there and the, 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 the misinterpretation and misreading of history and all of that, you nonetheless come to the, you can see in these pages how intense this man's hatred of Jews had become and how determined he was even as early as the mid-1920s, if the levers of power were in his hands, how determined he was, as he said, to bring about a great reckoning of accounts with the Jews, another phrase of, uh, of the Holocaust. So Heydrich once said to a group of his fellow SS generals, you know, the Fuhrer looks at himself like uh, he is the Robert Koch uh, uh, the, the, uh, the discoverer, the, the scientist, the leader of medicine who is uh, taking the world into a new era in which diseases may be eradicated as those diseases are associated with the Jews and the things that the Jews do. And by eliminating the Jews, the Fuhrer thinks that he will create a world that is pure, a world that is relieved of sickness because he, he, he believed that the Jews represented subhuman sickness. Untermenschtum Krankheit, subhuman sickness. So you get, once the Holocaust begins, in, in the semi-official transmission of communications among these uh, uh, top-level figures in the SS, Heinrich Himmler, Reinhard uh, Heydrich, Otto Ohlendorf, uh, Walter Kruger, uh, uh, 
Odilo Globochnik, the man who actually ran the, uh, the mass murder operation in Poland, uh, who, and who ran it under a code name. It wasn't called the extermination of the Jews in Poland. It was called Operation Reinhard. And it was called Operation Reinhard uh, in honor of the martyred Reinhard Heydrich, who had been assassinated by a, a, a Czech and a Slovak. Interesting that the history, in the history of that country, everything balances. Czech and Slovak, Czech and Slovak, right down to the killing of, of uh, Heydrich. Uh, it was uh, it was Josef Gobchik who threw the bomb that blew up and uh, blew the, the seat of the automobile into Heydrich's back and left him with the blood poisoning that uh, finally uh, killed him. But it was in the, I can't remember the other guy's name now, he was the Czech, and he stepped into the street in front of the car with the British Sten gun, which jammed. And he, uh, he would have killed Heydrich with the with a gun had the, had the British weapon fired, an automatic weapon, and had he killed Heydrich in the car, he would have killed the driver in the car, and the whole subsequent uh, course of events might have been different, but uh, in any event they were. But it was a Czech and a Slovak who were involved equally uh, in, the, uh, in the assassination of the most bloodthirsty tyrant uh, to oppress uh, the Czech and Slovak people and the Jews. Uh, living in Czechoslovakia. So in all of this, uh, there comes to be an understanding. In communicating with each other, uh, Heydrich and uh, Globochnik would not have to uh, jar their ears by using the word murder or by saying, uh, let's kill them all, or anything like that, they would simply use a term like uh, special treatment or evacuation, relocation. All of this became a terminology of, of mass murder. Resettlement, the most single notorious phrase, I think, in the Holocaust was the, was the phrase or the word, the term, or the terminology of resettlement. It carried the semi-fictional promise to the Jews who were being victimized that they were being loaded on a freight train because they were going to be sent to Eastern Europe and there they were going to be uh, allowed to develop a new life in a special kind of colony with agricultural uh, uh, activities as their major objectives and under the supervision of the SS and the Nazis. So they were being resettled to a new destination. To the SS and the perpetrators, however, resettlement mean, meant something absolutely different. It meant uh, uprooting and mass murder. You know, uh, over the years, uh, I've had a chance to look at hundreds, maybe even thousands of photographs of uh, all of this, these various stages of the Holocaust. And for some reason, among the most galvanic of these photos, the most unsettling, are photos that were taken at the uh, main train station in Munich on the night of November the 18th, 1941. They're photos of the Jewish community of Munich being loaded not into freight cars, but into passenger cars the SS had laid on a special train to take these evacuees. They were told they were being evacuated. That's another uh, euphemism that meant they're being sent to the east and you're not going to see them again. But here are these people uh, carrying as much clothing and personal possessions as they're allowed to carry by the Germans, 50 kilos being the, the absolute limit. And they're climbing into the compartments of these third-class passenger cars. Now, they don't have third-class passenger cars in Western Europe anymore, but uh, if you've ever ridden in a second-class coach compartment in a German train, it ain't the most comfortable thing in the world. And uh, you better be prepared to come out of it smelling like a cigarette for about two weeks or a French fry for about three weeks if you ride in coach class. So third class must have been even worse than that 
in the period of the Second World War. But here are these people being loaded uh, into this train, and the caption under the photo said, uh, evacuation of the Jews of Munich uh, to the east. Just evacuation of Jews of Munich to the east. There are similar pictures, photographs taken by the security police of the loading of Jews into the third class compartments of passenger trains in the cities of Osnabrück and Bielefeld at about the same time, November of 1941. And you look at those photographs with this euphemistic text that the Nazis themselves, that the SS developed for this, and you realize as you look at this, because here are uh, little children under the age of five carrying a doll or a blanket or the type of thing that small children carry along with their parents and grandparents and they're all trying to help each other get into the train. And those trains in, in, the, uh, in the caption it says being uh, uh, evacuated to Riga in the Ostland, in the uh, eastern territories uh, for resettlement. And you know because of the subsequent recording in the documents, you know that everybody on that train 72 hours later was murdered. The train trip took almost three days in brutally cold weather in unheated passenger car compartments and when the train was unloaded outside Riga, the German Jews on that train, all of them, including the small children, were forced march into the Rambula forest and there in pits that had been previously dug by other Jews and by Latvian collaborators, there they were all machine gunned and murdered. They were killed. They were subjected to special treatment. They had been resettled. The evacuees had reached their destination and they could be counted among those who were in the tally of the final solution. This is how the language goes. And it, it reads like this. One of the most fascinating uh, and I think unintentional things composed that shows you how fastidious the SS was about recording these things with this language, not, not using uh, what we would call the language of reality, but using the language of clerical euphemism, is what's called the Von Zay Protocol. This is the record, the official record, of the Von Zay Conference convened on Tuesday, January the 20th, 1942, at the villa on the lake, I'm Grossen Von Zay in Berlin. This is a conference Heydrich called and brought together all the principals in the, uh, the government ministries uh, and the other agencies that were going to be affected by carrying out the final solution to the Jewish question. And if you read this document, it is written with this sort of careful attention to the use of the language of indirection, to the language of the Holocaust. You don't see references to mass murder. You don't see references to shooting. You don't see uh, anything that would really give you a clue to how horrible the fate was going to be for all the people uh, who were to be the subject of this. And at one point, Heydrich is telling the conferees about what's going to happen, and he puts it into the terminology that says, well, uh, the, uh, the Jews from all over Europe are going to be subjected to a process in which Europe is combed through from west to east. In other words, beginning in France and continuing all the way into Eastern Europe. Combed through from west to east. And they're going to be transported to the east by train. And there, they're going to be resettled. And they will be divided by sex, men and women, into different groups. And they will be uh, subjected to forced labor mainly in construction and in the building of roads and transportation infrastructure in the new order in the East. Through that process, many will naturally fall away. He doesn't say 
they're going to die of exhaustion and disease, through the natural process, many will fall away. The remainder, the remainder, who will, of course, be the strongest remaining element uh, among the evacuees, among the Jews, and who will therefore constitute, who, who if left alone, therefore, would constitute the most dangerous segment of the race for the future, will have to be dealt with accordingly. Entsprechend behandelt werden müssen, to be dealt with accordingly. Now that is an absolutely bland phrase that could have meant anything in any other kind of document. Entsprechend behandelt werden müssen, dealt with accordingly. Here, of course, it means they're all going to be wiped out. And at the, in the same conference, though it's not in Eichmann's minutes, Heydrich had told the conferees that it is the Fuhrer's decision, it is the Fuhrer's wish. This is the other way they uh, used uh, language, misused language. They didn't say the Fuhrer has ordered, they said it is the Fuhrer's wish. The Fuhrer wants, he hadn't ordered, he wishes this, he wants it. It is the Fuhrer's wish that all the Jews of Europe be incorporated into the final solution. From the North Cape of Norway to the deserts of North Africa, from the Atlantic coast of occupied and unoccupied France to the Ural Mountains in Russia, that all the Jews, all the Jews, every single Jew without exception, be incorporated into the final solution, every last one, every single Jew. Uh, and although language played less important a role than did the other factors, like local complicity, the long-established traditions of anti-Semitism, the long-established traditions of violence in anti-Semitism in European communities. Language was nonetheless very, very important in giving the perpetrators a sense of how well they thought they were doing in meeting the goals and in communicating with each other uh, in a way that, uh, that spared them that spared them the unpleasantness of referring in language, literally, to what was happening to their victims, actually. Now, for once, uh, I've hit the timing bell almost right on the head. Uh, I think I had until 11.15, did I not? All right, uh, it's 11.16, so I'm going to stop at this point and uh, Elena, I'm going to be guided by you. If there's time for questions and, and uh, anybody uh, has a question they'd like to pose, I'll be glad to try to answer it. Yes, sir. Can you tell us, can you tell us where you can find more information about the two aspects of language? More information about the two aspects of language. First of all, uh, there's a new biography of Heinrich Himmler. Uh, by Peter Longrich, the same author of the Goebbels biography. It is probably now the most current thing in English. Uh, sadly, the, the, the published works that deal with, uh, that deal specifically with language as a subject, is language, in other words, an, an analysis of language, uh, the misuse of the German language, its perversion, are are books that are still in German, that have not been translated into English, with one important, uh, I think, exception to that. I don't know if any of you are aware of the diary of Victor Klemperer. Victor Klemperer was a German Jewish professor who taught, I think, French literature and comparative literature at the University of Dresden. Uh, he was Jewish. He was uh, kicked out of his university professorship in 1934, I think. And because he was married to a German, his wife was not Jewish. She was German. Because he was married to a German, he ended up being included in what was called a privileged mixed marriage. This is another one of these really bizarre uh, and archaic bureaucratic things. Anyway, the point is that Klemperer kept a meticulous diary 
of what was going on uh, in, in the course of the Third Reich, of their daily struggle to stay alive, of the near misses that he had with the authorities who were constantly looking for some loophole, some, some technicality, some fine print somewhere that would enable them to arrest him and deport him so that uh, he could be uh, killed at the other end of the line. And uh, he managed to avoid that, and he survived. And, his, and more importantly, his diary survived. His diary is in English. It was translated uh, some years ago. There is where you will find the most extensive uh, references, because the way, the way the Nazis were using the language was a subject of interest to Klemperer because he was a linguist. So the diary of Victor Klemperer is, and, and right now I can't think of another place where, um, where language, would, uh, language would be the specific study of, a specific object of focus in a work. But if so, something may occur before you leave, and if it does, uh, I, I'll certainly tell you about it. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Both of these are in the shop downstairs. They're about language, too. Yeah, well, Goebbels, the biography of Goebbels includes uh, language. Goebbels, in, in uh, Longerich's book, the, the Goebbels' abilities as a propagandist are extensively uh, evaluated. And in the process of evaluating that, Longerish looks at how ingeniously Goebbels misused the, uh, the German language and how effectively it was used in publications. For example, in uh, the fall of 1941, at about the time the, uh, the Star of David was introduced in Nazi Germany as a requirement for German Jews to wear in public, uh, Goebbels published this article in uh, a weekly uh, news magazine called The Reich, uh, and the title of the article was The Jews Are Guilty. And here he laid out the case uh, that uh, was the, 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 the basis of, of Hitler's determination to uh, get rid of this internal enemy before the Jews were capable of doing again to Germany what had been done with a stab in the back. In the, in, the, uh, in the First World War. So yeah, there's a lot in here about language, an awful lot about language as part of the propaganda. Yes, sir? Could you give us a brief review of the development of the use of gas when they started till the end? Question is, uh, summarize the, the, the development of the use of gas. Gas vans. Very important and very interesting. There's a chapter in Mein Kampf this is Hitler's autobiography, which is written in 1924, so you can date the authorship of this reference, in which he says that in the First World War, because uh, the army had been stabbed in the back by civilian politicians, by communists and socialists and Jews and Jewish politicians, it would probably would have been better if 15, 10 to 15,000 of the uh, children of Israel or the Hebrews uh, had been subjected to poison gas. That is in part driven by Hitler's own personal experience because he was the victim of a British mustard gas attack very near the end of the war, about a couple of months before the war ended. And gas and the use of gas in the First World War had a terrifying aspect to it that it did not during the Second World War. So here is, a, here is a reference that Hitler writes down in 1924 that illustrates how aware he is that of, of the potential lethal characteristics of gas. So uh, the, the next time this comes into official Nazi consideration is in uh, the summer of 1939 as uh, uh, the country is about to go to war with Poland, the regime, and this initiative clearly comes from Hitler, the regime is considering how to kill people who are mentally 
disturbed, people who are uh, mentally retarded, people who are physically handicapped, people who are bipolar, people who are, are uh, severe alcoholics, people who are chronically unemployable, people who just can't hold a job, people who in Hitler's view are imperfect. These are people who are obstacles to the creation of a racially pure society, a racially pure society. These are people who need to be eliminated. The best way to purify society is simply get rid of these people. If you want to get, if you want to get rid of cancer, you have to cut it out of the body politic and you have to kill enough of it to make sure you get all of it. So how do you kill it? Well, you have to do it quietly because this kind of, this kind of, initi this kind of government initiated mass murder is clearly considered a crime in Western civilization. It is gonna, it will create public unrest and a backlash if discovered. So the way this was done, Hitler dictated a one sentence letter and signed it that authorized his personal physician, uh, SS Dr. Karl Brandt, and Brandt's associate, Philip Buhler, who was the chief of Hitler's chancellery, to establish a, a group of medical commissions, groups of three doctors, and these commissions would examine the, uh, the institutions in Germany in which there were people who were mentally uh, handicapped, uh, the, the insane asylums, if you will, and go through the insane asylums and look and see who among the inmates would be uh, eligible to be uh, included in the euthanasia program, would be eligible to be awarded or accorded a mercy death. And to do that, Brandt and Buhler had the authority to decide on the means that would be used to kill the, the, uh, the people who were going to be murdered. And they hit upon, it's not clear which one, I think probably both together, hit upon the idea that the, the, the most effective and top secret way to do this was to select certain institutions. And they picked six uh, institutions in Germany, uh, Hadamar, Bernbeck, Sonnenstein, I, I never can remember all six together, but they were institutions that were all around Germany and uh, they would create in these institutions a sealed chamber and in the sealed chamber, which would be, res which would be constructed to resemble a shower room, the, uh, the victims would be taken, they'd be transferred from wherever they were in an institution to one of these facilities. They'd be told they're being resettled there and they would be told they needed to take a shower in order to be registered and processed and once they had they'd removed their clothes and were in the room, the doors would be sealed, and bottled carbon monoxide would be used to kill them. And within 15 minutes, uh, because the gas was odorless and tasteless, uh, they would die, uh, hopefully without being aware of what was happening to them, they'd simply go to sleep. Well, in some cases this worked, in some cases it didn't. But the use of this gas proved absolutely ideal as far as the, uh, as the authors, Brandt and Buhler, were concerned. So they built a bureaucratic network of specialists who worked for them, who were charged with, with the constructing and maintaining these facilities. In the summer of, and, and by the summer of 1941, by August of 1941, about 70,000 people had been murdered this way. And this included people who, who came under the definition of asocials. That was a special category that the Gestapo created for people uh, who, were, who were just misfits in society. And the most prominent group of people who were arrested, rounded up, sent to these places and killed by this method were homeless people on the streets. Hitler considered that homeless people uh, obviously carried some kind of terrible uh, stigma to them uh, and, and were unsightly being out on the street and he wanted them uh, done away with. Well, in August of 41, 
the program had become the object of widespread discussion in Germany. And two of the most prominent uh, clergymen in the country, uh, Catholic uh, uh, figures, uh, Clemens August Graf von Galen, the Archbishop of Munster, and Cardinal Theodor Fallhauber, uh, the primate of Munich, uh, they got into their pulpits. They found out about this. The Catholic Church had an intelligence service that was really, really well put together in Germany. And these two men uh, had, were very well informed about what the regime was doing. When they got the full details about what was going on and how many people were being murdered and how ordinary German families now were be, who knew about this were beginning to fear that if their son came home from Russia and he had been mutilated by wounding, if he had lost an arm and maybe part of a leg, he was physically deformed, physically defected, he might end up being included in this program and murdered. There was a lot of public unrest. So Hitler ordered that the program be suspended. That the euthanasia, this is in August. In fact, it was August the 16th, 1941. He ordered that the, that the, uh, the program be suspended. Now, in point of fact, it was suspended temporarily, but then it was resumed. And it was re resumed uh, first, and then resumed most widely in the murder of children. Uh, at the time it was uh, ended, Himmler, Heydrich, and the uh, SS principals were looking for a place to construct killing facilities where large numbers of Jews could be murdered. And these were to be killing facilities in remote, rural parts of Eastern Europe that were nonetheless served by railroad lines where trainloads of people could be shipped. Well, if you're going to ship trainloads of people to these places, how do you kill a trainload of people? Well, obviously you can't do it by shooting them because it takes too long uh, and it's, it's not like uh, the action commandos in the Soviet Union. But you can kill them with gas. That's been proved in the euthanasia program. So a number of the specialists who had been involved in creating the gassing technology to murder the physically handicapped and the mentally disabled were, were already commissioned officers in the SS. They were transferred to the staff of Operation Reinhardt and they were put to work constructing and running the gassing facilities at, uh, at, these can at Belzec, Sobibor, Treblinka, and Kelmno. There was, however, competition to this and the comp competition was at Auschwitz. And at Auschwitz, uh, Carl Fritz, who was the deputy commandant, he was Rudolf Huss's number two man, he had hit upon the idea of using a prussic acid-based uh, pesticide, Zyklon B, which was, used, uh, which was already being used at Auschwitz to fumigate uh, dirty inmate uniforms that were full, full of lice. And he proved by experimentation that you could use Zyklon B if you, could, if you could seal a group of people into a chamber and have a tube that introduced the gas from above. The crystals of Zyklon B, once they were dropped, would vaporize when they hit, a, when they hit the floor, when they hit the, the, uh, a hard subject. So you shake the crystals out of a container down this tube into the chamber and the gas dissipates and within about 15 minutes it kills everybody there because it paralyzes the lungs. And the closer you are to the source of the gas, the quicker you die. Now he tried this in uh, a, a, a jerry-rigged facility in Auschwitz I in the original main camp. And once this proved effective and in, the, in Huss's view really efficient, because they initially they could kill 100 to 200 people at a time in one of these sealed chambers. They then took two farmhouses that were in the immediate vicinity. They sealed them up and they began using them as gas chambers. And the first Jews deported to Auschwitz from Holland 
and France in the late spring and summer of 1942 were gassed in these facilities. The potential that this had convinced Huss that bigger, more permanent facilities had to be constructed somewhere, so they built these mammoth uh, uh, concrete and brick uh, undressing rooms and gas chambers and the attached crematoria inside the, the wire of Auschwitz II, of Birkenau, the death camp, what became the extermination camp at Auschwitz. So while Globochnik and the staff of Operation Reinhard were murdering Jews at Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka with carbon monoxide gas pumped in from diesel engines, Huss and Fritsch and the staff at Auschwitz were murdering first Soviet prisoners of war and then Jews with Zyklon B enter, entered into the chambers from uh, these slots above. And in both instances, at Treblinka, over 900,000 Jews were murdered in uh, about 13 months. At Birkenau, uh, over the course of the life of Auschwitz, 1.1 million people were murdered about a million of them Jews. Most of those were murdered in the gas chambers at, uh, at Birkenau, in the big facilities that came online in uh, February and March of 1943. That's as, uh, as much as I can condense it, but uh, without doing violence to the whole thing, leaving things out. But anyway, uh, am I out of time? I'm out of time. I, I think we are, but I think that's a, a great time. Well, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Sidner for <laughs> And I think it was a great transition because outside here we have a wonderful exhibit about Auschwitz that, uh, that this museum created. It's a traveling exhibit. It, it goes and it comes back. So take a little bit of time. I think we have about uh, 20 minutes uh, to take a look at that exhibit. We'll set up lunch in here and we'll give you the high sign and we can come in here and, and have a little lunch. Uh, can I say one word about the exhibit? Please Just about Auschwitz. Sure. Uh, we are, as a staff here, very proud of the, the ability that all of us together here have had with the knowledge and with access to resources and historical sources to have constructed what you're going to see in the next room. It is a history of the Auschwitz complex. There was not one camp at Auschwitz or two. There were three, and then there were, in addition to the three, 29 subcamps. Uh, outside uh, Auschwitz. But the work that you'll see in the next room has all been done here. It was done by the staff uh, and by the specialists here who put these uh, exhibits together. You will see in the exhibit a number of photographs that have no people in them, that have nothing but buildings or vistas and paths and buildings and grass and whatnot. Those are photographs I took at Auschwitz in June of 1987, uh, when the Polish government was still in power in, in the country and before Auschwitz had become a tourist attraction. And I was able to spend an entire day by myself without another living thing being there in Auschwitz to Birkenau and took the photographs uh, and based on Tim Hensley's interpretation, he took the most representative of those and included them in uh, this exhibit. So those are not photographs that were made by the SS uh, in 1944. Those are photographs I made in 1987. All the other photographs you'll see, which have people in them, were photographs that were made by the SS at Auschwitz uh, during, during the, uh, the period that it was a mass murder site. Thank you. Thank you very much. Charlie, be around to ask, answer questions as well. You'll be around. Yeah. Right? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs>